Good morning, good morning, Rolling Hills Church family. It's so great to be together today. Welcome by here to Franklin Campus. Welcome our line campus. So glad that we can worship our great God together. And welcome back to our series on heaven. And what an incredible series this has been. Now, I've always kind of imagined heaven, there's parts of heaven that look like Hawaii. So I'm pretty excited this week since we've had so much snow. I'm ready for that part of heaven, you know, that we'll be able to go there. It'll be warm. It'll be nice. But I hope you've had a good time maybe sledding or being with family or just staying warm but hopefully it's going to warm up that we are so blessed to have a place where God is present in this worship in this place that we can come and gather so thank you for everybody joining in today and I've just loved this series we talked the first week about this what is heaven and we determined from God's word that heaven is a place a place that Jesus says I've gone to prepare a place for you Heaven's mentioned over 550 times in the Bible that Jesus talks a lot about heaven. Jesus talks a lot about hell as well, right? He talked about both. But for us, if you are in Christ, there is a place that we go when we die. There is a place that we will spend eternity. Last week, we said that the only way to heaven is through Jesus, right? And the world would say there's being good, or the world would say, you know, being born in the right family or being at church. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. That God made a way for us that we can have salvation, the repentance of our sins as we yield our lives to Christ and become his disciples and follow him. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And today we're talking about this. What will we do in heaven? What will we do in heaven? Now, as a kid, I used to like kind of freak out about that. Okay, I would lay in bed at night and I would think, I'm going to get bored Right? Anybody else think this was just me, right? I was thinking, like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Like, I don't like to be bored anyway. I'm one of these people, I, I'm always active. I always kind of get scared if I'm on a plane, I'm going to get bored. And so I have all kinds of books and my computer and everything. And I'm like, what if I run out of things to do? And then I'm just locked in there. Like, it's going to be crazy. So, so for me to think about eternity, I had to go, okay, God, what am I going to do? Right? Am I going to go stir crazy for eternity? And then I started reading God's word and I'm like, whoa, wow, wait a minute. It's going to be more incredible than you can even imagine. No, I'm not going to be bored. It's going to be amazing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I hope and pray in this series, right? For all of us, it's just kind of a, you know, light bulb moment, right? As we realize what heaven's actually going to be like. As we realize the goodness and grace that God has for us. And so many people, they live like they're scared of eternity instead of living in the fullness of that life even now. You know, you go to a financial planner, right? Or you'll go get life insurance. You'll plan a vacation and all that just lasts for like a little bit of time. But eternity lasts forever. And so for us to study and to dive deep there, I was reading a book by Max Lucado, and, and, and he talked about going camping. And he said, you know, you get your tent, you set up the tent. He said, there was a family and friends, and we're hiking, we're fishing, we have a cookout and s'mores. He goes, I didn't spend the whole time decorating my tent, right? I didn't spend the whole time calling Amazon and going, hey, I need a delivery. We're going to renovate the tent. We're going to make the tent better while we're here. It's like, no, 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 no. The tent was temporary. I invested the time in those relationships. I invested the time in the things that mattered and I thought yeah and how often do we do that right I'm gonna renovate my house again and again and that's fine but you know what we're just only here for a little bit but what about the things that are gonna last for eternity what about the things that are gonna go on and on and on and on how much do we know and how much are we living for that knowledge to be in that right relationship with God Francis Chan does this great illustration and he takes a rope you know and he draws a red line on the rope and he said okay that represents your life The 70, 80, 90 years here, right? And then the rest of the rope that goes down and out here and out the back door and down the side, that's eternity, okay? So this 70, 80, 90 years, it is short. It is quick. But what you do here impacts everything else. So let's get this right. Let's dive into God's word. Let's know how he's calling us to live and let's know what our eternity is gonna be like forever. Hey, if you have a Bible with you today, I invite you up with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation, let's go to the end. Okay, very last book of the Bible. Turn back there, Revelation chapter 21. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, there's a free Bible in the back. Love for you to take it. It's yours. If you're online, go to the Church Center app, the Rolling Hills app there, and you can find God's word. Revelation literally means to draw back the curtain. The apostle John is in exile on the island of Patmos, and God goes, John, I'm gonna give you a glimpse into heaven, and you write it down. 
I want my followers to know. I want my children to know what it's going to be like. And so he does. That's what you see here. So Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, we talked about that the first week. But a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, a lot of people think, well, does that mean there's no water in heaven or no ocean? No, no, no. Back then, people were scared of the sea. The sea represented, right, the unknown. It represented chaos, right? They didn't know. They didn't have, you know, people going out and exploring that. So, so when he says that, that means there's no stress, no worry, no fear, right? I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Isn't that beautiful? Beautifully dressed. And I heard a loud voice from the heaven, from the throne, saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then look at verse 4. I don't know if you underline your Bible, if you highlight, you star, whatever you do, do it right here. Okay, verse 4, do this, because it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Isn't that awesome? He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Isn't that amazing? There's no funerals in heaven, right? There's no hospice. There's no brokenness. There's no pain. It says in verse five, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new, exclamation point. Then he said, write this down. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Make sure that people know. Make sure that they get it. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. As clear as crystal, there is water, right? Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now remember when God first created the world, what did he create? A garden. Garden of Eden, and it was perfect, and it was beautiful for two chapters, Genesis 1 and 2. And then Genesis chapter 3, man sinned. And we've been seeing that the whole time throughout God's word, and we feel that in our lives. But when you get to the end, God's like, I'm making it all new. I'm making it all right. I'm restoring it all. And the beautiful trees that are blossomed, the beautiful trees and the fruit, no longer will there be any curse, the curse of sin. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. Can you imagine seeing the face of God? I mean, doesn't that just give you like, I mean, like, oh, wow. I mean, to be fully known and fully accepted, you will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Wow. He says, listen, you're going to have jobs to do. There's going to be things to do in heaven. There's going to be worship that's going to be happening in heaven. You're going to see my face in heaven. No more death. No more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. It'll all be made new, it'll all be made right, and it'll be your eternal home. Praise be to God. Wow. All right, if you're taking notes today, here's some things I would love for you to write down. Oh, man, I'm so excited. Uh, if you have a worship guide or if you're online, if you want to go there to the Church Center app, here's some things I'd just love for us to get from God's Word today about our eternal home. Look at this. Number one, in heaven you'll have a new body. Praise God, okay? You know, like in heaven, you will have a new body. Because a lot of times you're looking at this, you're reading this, like, how am I going to do that? I'm going to die, right? And then I'm going to get resurrected. Am I floating around like a ghost? No, no, you're going to have a new body. Look at the Apostle Paul tells us. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body okay you will have a resurrected body now you may remember when jesus died he was resurrected he was in his resurrected body 
The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. I wish I had time to dive into this more, but you can put a little note out there if you want to in your notes to go back and look at it. But he talks about a seed. When a seed falls into the ground, right? You're like, is that seed gone? No, I mean, that seed's going to bloom. But that seed's not coming back just to look at the same seed. That seed, it blooms and blossoms into this beautiful tree, into this beautiful flower. There is something new and different. When we die, we are buried into the earth. But we then are resurrected by the grace and the goodness of God into a resurrected body. Now, your eternal body, right, is going to be able to do some things. It's going to be awesome. You know, you think about this, that that. Jesus was able to walk through doors. (laughs) Jesus, after his resurrected body, had conversations with people. So your body, you're still going to be able to have conversations. Jesus ate. You'll be able to eat. The amazing part to me is in heaven, there's not going to be any calories. That's going to be awesome, okay? So, right, the wedding feast of the lamb, it's like game on. You know, it's like an unsupervised kid at a birthday party. You know, you're just grabbing it. No calories, not worried about it. That's going to be awesome, you know? In heaven, I think, you know, I'm probably going to look like the rock, be chiseled, you know, it's like, don't even have to work out eight, eight hours a day, you know, or anything, but, but you know, you're going to have a body that's not going to wear out. Now, the older you get, this is really good news, right? Maybe you've watched your grandparents and they've gotten older and you're like, oh man, you know, but your body does start to wear out in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I remember as a kid, we used to play basketball like all day. We wouldn't stop. It was just like game on, game on, you know, let run it back, run it back, you know. Now you go on a couple of games, you're like, all right, I'm tired, next, you know, it's like, but imagine in heaven, you just don't wear out. You have a body that keeps going. Here's the second thing, right? You will know people in heaven. You will know people in heaven. Remember the disciples, Jesus took them up on the Mount of Transfiguration and immediately they knew Moses and Elijah, knew them, recognized them, saw them. I mean, you're gonna know people in heaven. That's awesome. Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus and, and he's explaining to these guys in his resurrected body about the Old Testament. I couldn't imagine, right? He's talking about how the Messiah had to come, how everything had to happen. And it says when he broke the bread, they realized, where's Jesus? They're just having this conversation. They're like, Jesus, we recognize Jesus. He appeared to his disciples. They recognized him. Now think about that. You're going to know people, right? You're maybe your great, great grandfather. Maybe, you know, somebody you wanted to spend time with, somebody through history that you go, man, they walked with the Lord. I can't wait to hear their story. Maybe somebody you're like, man, I can't wait to hang out with Joshua. Just like, how was that back then in your day? You know, what was it like being with Joshua? James and John and seeing these miracles firsthand. I, how amazing to have conversations. How did you live for Christ in your day and generation? And they're asking you. How did you live for Christ in the middle of all the distractions, in the middle of all the things that took place in your day and your generation? You're like, man, it was hard to stay faithful, I tell you. Hard not to get distracted. But you're going to have that kind of time with the people that you love. The heroes of the faith who've gone before us. This is the time that we prepare. Well, guys, listen, you're going to be the best version of you. You're going to be the best version of you. You know, scientists tell us we only use about 10% of our brains. You know that, right? Uh, we only use about 10% of our brain. Well, why did God give us this big brain? I believe in heaven, we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep learning. There's all kinds of truth that God's going to continue to develop inside of us. You know, you think about a body that doesn't wear out, a mind that doesn't wear out. You think about the way that you want to have time to create or to build or to do these different things that you, God's put in your heart to do. And then to have the time and the capacity to do it, not being confounded by all the things that, that would hold us down here. Not having, you know, the things that come into our minds and the discouragements and the doubts, but having fully cleared, fully open to the word of the Lord, being able to be fully you. I remember we had a woman in our church named uh, Sarah Zell, and Sarah was just amazing. I mean, really, from the beginning of our church, I mean, Sarah was just a rock star. She would come, she would help do things and get things ready, but Sarah spent her entire life in a wheelchair. She was born with brittle bone disease. <laughs> Sarah went on, she didn't let it keep her down, though. She went to Vanderbilt, graduated magna cum laude, went and got her master's at Peabody, and then taught at Vanderbilt, and then she would come every Sunday here at church, and she would serve. She would serve with the kids. She'd roll in her wheelchair and all these kids would gather around. I mean, they loved Sarah. Sarah loved being with them. In fact, when Sarah died, she left in her will the money to build that playground out there in the preschool area. That was from Sarah. But you know, I think often about Sarah now. Sarah's not confined to a wheelchair. 
She's not. She is alive. She's dancing in the street. She is celebrating. I just imagine all the people that are around her and hearing her story and like, yeah, how did you not complain during that? She's like, no, Jesus, look what he's done. Think about being your grandparents or your great-grandparents or people that you just wanted to. and Maybe they passed before you knew them or, or maybe they were so old that you didn't have a chance to really have these conversations. Man, think about you being the best version of you. All those dreams and desires in your life coming to fruition. Listen, in heaven, you'll be in perfect relationship with God and with others. You will be in perfect relationship with God and with others. That, that is the beautiful thing to me. Let's go back. You know, we're in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. Let's go back to the very beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter one. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. So a lot of things that we do, right? God made us in his image, those things. Male and female, he created them. See, man was created to be in perfect relationship with God and with others. So Genesis 1 and 2, when everything was perfect, when everything was right, God put man in the Garden of Eden, and they were walking with God in the cool of the day. Can you imagine? It's like, God, what's going on? They talk about this, you know? And then they're in right relationship with the other, Adam and Eve. They had this beautiful marriage. They would talk about things, everything out in the open, being real, being authentic, being vulnerable, just being who they were created to be. In fact, you were created for a relationship with God. Just know that. And you can try to fill your life with all the things in this world, it's not gonna satisfy. It's not. Right? There's so many people who be like, if I just have more money, you never have enough money, right? You know, if I could just get this job, this position, if I could do this, if I could do that. Work on this relationship. When you fall more in love with God, when you dive into God's word, when you find your worth and your value in him, it impacts everything else in your life. But you were created that way. There's this verse in chapter two, Genesis, before the sin, before the fall, Genesis three, it says this, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. <laughs> that is powerful right there. That ends Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, right? They, they sin, but, but man, think about this, feeling no shame. Think about just being fully who you are before God. You know, there's so many people that are scared of God because they think about the past. I remember in my younger years thinking, oh no, I'm gonna stand before God one day and he's gonna have this whole video of all the mistakes I've made and all the mess ups in my life. That's what heaven is gonna be like. I'd be like, well, no wonder I don't wanna go there. You know, that, that would be terrible. And that's like, no, that's not what the Bible says at all. In fact, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can be who you are before God. He sees everything. But when Jesus died on that cross, he died for your past sins, your present sins, your future sins. You are forgiven. And now standing before God, not in shame, not in guilt, but fully alive. <laughs> but also in that relationship with others. You know, in heaven, you're not competing with everybody. In heaven, you're not trying to measure up. In heaven, you're not trying to manipulate people. In heaven, there's no jealousy or envy. That's what Adam and Eve had before. And then man sinned. In Genesis chapter three, man sinned. And what happened? They said, God, we don't want to do it your way. And there was this tree, right? I'm going to go and take it myself. I'm going to do it my way. And then what happens? Blame. They start blaming. Well, well, what was his fault? They tried to hide from God, right? And then the man says, well, the woman's the one who gave it to me. You know, like, I, you know, and this, the, the woman's like, well, it was a serpent, right? It was everybody else's fault. And the blame enters into the world. And then Jesus comes by God's grace and atones for our sins, atones for our sins. But imagine one day being fully you before God, knowing that your sins are atoned for, knowing that your mistakes have been made right, and being who you are, not living in the guilt, not living in the shame. Guys, in heaven, we're gonna be in perfect relationship with God and with others. Perfect. And to me, that is awesome. Sitting down, having conversations, laughing, discussing, growing, learning, right? Not trying to cover up, not all my mistakes and all my mess ups, not trying to be somebody else, not the imposter syndrome. I could be fully me and you could be fully you. A lot of people ask the question, will we be married in heaven? You ever thought about that? We'll be married in heaven. That's a great question. I'm gonna let Jesus answer that question for us this morning because he actually does. 
he was asked that question. So in Matthew chapter 22, verse 23, it tells us this. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. So there were two religious groups back then, right? You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the religious leaders back then, and they believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees were also the religious leaders, but they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they were sad, you see, okay? <laughs> That's how you know, right? So you know the difference. They were sad, no resurrection. So they didn't believe in the resurrection, these sad, you sees. And they came to Jesus trying to disprove the resurrection. And they said, teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, this is a way that God used to protect women. Back in this day, women had no rights. In fact, Jesus did more for women's rights than any person in history. But back then, right, you know, under the law, women had, had no rights, right? So God institutes and says, hey, wait a minute. If a woman, her husband dies, the, the husband was the protection, right? And if she didn't have a son or have a father, somebody to stand in the gap, then he said, okay, the brother of her husband should take her in. Well, now there were seven brothers, they said, among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? So they think. Oh, we got Jesus now, right? There can't be a resurrection. You're not going to be married. I mean, she's married seven times. Who's she going to be married to? But listen to Jesus. Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So Jesus tells us right there, we won't be married in heaven. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, ah, oh. others are like, oh, okay. But, you know, <laughs> I hope it's the former, right? Not the latter. But, but anyway, we're doing a whole marriage series next. But, but here's the thing, <laughs> right? But here's the deal. It, it makes sense, though, doesn't it, right? I mean, like, because people have been married or people have gone through a, a divorce or people, you know, their spouses died and they remarried or people who are single adults. But what he's saying is this. Now, in heaven, you're going to know everybody. You're going to be right relationship. I love my wife. She's awesome. And I wish we were going to be married in heaven. But, but I know we're going to have houses right next to each other. I've already been put in praying about that. And our kids are all going to be right around. I've been praying about having a tree where we can all meet at Rolling Hills. We're just all going to gather together. So we have all of our friends and all of our family. But that's what it's going to be like. We're all going to be in right relationship. I do think we'll be with our families, with our friends, with people that we know. But then Jesus goes on. This is brilliant right here. Okay. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's like, oh yeah, there's a resurrection. Not I was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am. He says, I know those guys, and they're still alive. And so will you if you are in Christ. That's brilliant. Uh, there was a family and they had a five-year-old daughter who was, had cancer. And uh, so they, you know, were, she was worried and they were worried and they were praying. And they said, little darling, here's what we're going to do. They invited all of her family, all of her friends over. And, and they didn't tell her, but they, they had everybody hiding in the living room and they had the door closed. And they said, this is what heaven's going to be like. And they opened the door and they all just started cheering for her. They all, they said, listen, you may get there before us, but we're all going to be there. And it's going to be like that. And you're going to have all of us together celebrating with you. You know, heaven's going to be like a big surprise party. I mean, you get to the gate. It's just like all these people welcoming you home. People you've impacted that maybe you didn't even know. People you've been in a relationship with. People that you prayed for. People from overseas that you just prayed or you gave or you supported. It's going to be incredible. Man, I can't wait. All right, listen. We will have work to do in heaven. We will have work to do in heaven. A lot of you are like, oh, great. We're not married and we have work to do. Great. You know, like, here we go. Sounding better and better. But listen, listen, listen. Work's going to be different and it's going to be amazing. Here's what it tells us. The Lord God took the man, this is Genesis 2, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So when God created this whole world, right? When God created the Garden of Eden, 
He put man in to work the garden, to do it. Work, listen, work was given before the fall. The fall comes in Genesis chapter 3. The fall enters in in Genesis 3 when man sins. But work was given already. So there will be work to do in heaven. Now, think about this. You're not going to hate your job. (laughs) In heaven, you're going to have time to do what you want to do. In heaven, you're going to have time to create. You're going to have time to build. Some of you, you know inside, man, you just want to, you want to paint or you want to design or you want to garden or you want to do these things that you don't have time to do or you don't have the resource to do. But imagine having all of that to do. Imagine having this incredible time to be who you are and to do the things that you were created to do and then to bring that as an offering to God. That's going to be awesome. As a pastor, uh, I'm kind of sad because I'm going to be out of a job, right? Everybody in heaven knows Jesus. Everybody in heaven, they're going to have a lot better teachers, right? Jesus is over there teaching God's word, right? You know, I mean, I'm not going to have weddings to do or funerals to do, right? All that is out. I don't have anybody to tell about Jesus because everybody knows Jesus. So I'm going to audition for the worship team. I can't wait. I, I audition already. I never make it here at Rolling Hills. They're too good. But maybe in heaven, I'll be like on the side team or something. Or I'm going to be a greeter. I can't, I would love to be a greeter. You know, I have a gates when people are coming into heaven and like, welcome. I don't know, but I can't wait. I'm going to have something that I get to do there. See, listen, in this broken world, sometimes relationships and work are hard. It's not a newsflash for anybody, right? You just feel it. You feel like relationships sometimes are hard. You feel like, man, work is hard. You feel like it's a drudgery sometimes, but but it's not gonna be like that in heaven. Sometimes people hear it's so hard that, man, they just try to cope, just try to get by. There's people that go, I just wanna get home so I can get some alcohol, so I can just numb the pain. Or I just scroll all day so I don't have to engage with my family, with my kids. uh, People numb themselves, but but can you imagine not having to do that? In fact, you shouldn't do that, right? Here, you should live fully alive. Here, you should go, listen, I only have this for a short time, and then I have eternity to come. Here, I don't want to sit there and numb the pain. I want to be fully alive now. I want to be fully engaged now. I want to know that God is with me now, and I want to live that way, because the fact is this. God wants you to know the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. God writes so much about heaven because he wants us to know the hope that is. He wants us to not just see this world as a burden, but to use this time that we have to prepare for eternity. Here's what the apostle Paul says. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And sometimes it doesn't feel light and momentary, the troubles that we go through. I know. But in the scheme of eternity, it is. So do it for the glory of God. Do it right. Invest, love, pray, care. Take advantage of this time that you have and use it for the God's name and renown. Guys, there will be crowns in heaven. There will be crowns in heaven. And, and that's important for us to know. God talks about it a lot. Jesus wants us to know. Here's what Jesus says. Look. I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Uh, That's pretty clear. Okay, Jesus, I want you to know this. I want you to know that there are rewards. There are crowns in heaven. Crowns in heaven are based on what we do on this earth. All right, now that means that we only have 60, 70, 80, 90 years to earn those crowns because once you're in heaven, Everybody's a Christian, so you don't earn any rewards in heaven. It only happens right here, right now. It tells us in 1 Corinthians, right? It says, do you not know that all the runners in a race run? And they run to get a prize that will not last, but we run it to get a crown that will last forever. So what you see is there's five different crowns if you go to study the New Testament. Uh, I don't have time to dive into all, but I wish I did because they're so good. But there's verses in your worship guide that you can look at later on. But the first crown is this, the crown of inheritance. The crown of inheritance. Now, every one of us will get this crown. If you've committed your life to Christ, you are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Therefore, when you get to heaven, you have an inheritance. It tells us in 1 Peter, an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? So when you walk in, you get a crown. Woo, 
praise God, all right? Because maybe you're thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get crowned. Yeah, you got one. I got one, right? We're going to get crowned. Crown of inheritance. Second crown is the crown of rejoicing. Crown of rejoicing. You read in 1 Thessalonians. It talks about this. I think this is that crown uh, of your attitude, your character. The Bible tells us rejoice always. Pray continually, you know. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. And so those times in your life when you go, well, I could complain all the time. I could act like there's no God. I can make life all about me. Or I can rejoice. Rejoice always. I'll say it again, Paul says. Rejoice in our lives. Are we conforming to the character of Christ? Are we being transformed? There'll be crowns on our attitude and how we live this life. The third crown is this, the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. It talks about in Revelation, the righteous acts of the saints. That's the incense before the Lord God Almighty. So when you do things to help people, when you pray for people, when you bless people, when you teach, when you lead, when you love, when you, those are righteous acts. And those are crowns that are being ready and formed for you in heaven. The fourth crown is this, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. Now, I think this crown is, is the one that you start to see that's going to outlast you. Outlast you. So when you do things, like you build God's church, right? God's church is going to outlast us. It's outlasted us 2,000 years. It's going to go on long after us. You know, that is for the glory of God. That's not for you. You don't get the glory for that. God gets the glory for that. When you pour into your kids, you disciple them, or your grandkids, you disciple them, they're going to outlast you, most likely, right? And so there'll be glory that they're going to be giving to God for generations to come. The last one is the crown of life. The crown of life. And that is eternal life. You know, it will never perishable or fade, right? This net of imperishable, right? It is not going to go away. You have this eternal life in Christ, right? Not the perishable that I'm here today and gone tomorrow. It is the imperishable that God is with you forever and ever. Now, what are we going to do with these crowns? I don't think we're going to walk around and go, wow, look, man, they got a lot of crowns. <laughs> I didn't get that many. Awkward. You know, I don't think we're going to be doing that. Or we're going to be looking at missionaries and we're going to be seeing, I'll be in the Amazon with some of these pastors and their wives. Oh, they, they're going to have tons of crowns. These jungle pastors that walk through the jungle at serving churches all over. But, but here's what I think we're going to do. We're going to get the crowns. There's going to be this great welcoming celebration. And then we'll ultimately lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> It'll be the greatest worship service you've ever been a part of. And you're just going to come in and just go, God, all glory to you. All glory to you. And you lay your crowns down. And think about every tongue, every tribe throughout history coming there before the throne of God and just worshiping him. Oh, wow. It's going to be amazing. So here's what I'd love for you to do. And I pray that we do. Live as a citizen of heaven now. Live as a citizen of heaven now. Guys, when you accept Christ, eternal life begins then. Right? We don't go from life to death. We go from life to life. This life to eternal life. So live as a citizen of heaven now. Here's what Paul says. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears. Paul's like, I just want you to get this. Right? He's just praying. He's pouring his heart out. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. (laughs) Our citizenship is in heaven. Guys, you are a citizen of heaven. Live that way. So here's four things. Number one, love God and love others. Love God and love others. If we're going to do that for all eternity, let's start now. Jesus said the most important commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's do it now. Let's fall more in love with God. Diving into his word, being at church, being in worship, being in his presence, being in community group, men's group, diving in. But also let's love others. Let's forgive. Let's offer grace. Let's be kind. Let's not always compete with everybody around us to see how we measure up. Let's bless them and encourage them. Second thing is serve God now. Right? It tells us in Revelation, we will serve the Lord. So let's practice. Let's get ready. Here's a couple of ways. We talk about Rolling Hills. Worship one, serve one. You know, worship one hour, serve one hour. 
You could do that, right? Serve at 930, come to worship at 11. But, you know, you can work with preschool, children, students. You can be a greeter. You can be an usher. You know, you can do worship team, tech team. You can be in the parking lot. There's all kinds of ways for us to serve now. Or maybe you want to be a part of the new campus launch team. You know, we have our new campus that we're launching there over by the airport. It's called Haywood Hills, right? It's our Nashville South Campus. It's right by the zoo. Maybe you just go, hey, I, I could take a year. I could be a part of this launch team. We're, we're asking 100 people from Franklin to go over to instill the DNA right there in this new campus. And you can still come on Sunday nights. You can still come on Wednesday nights. You can still watch online. It, but help us grow this campus. There's 28 different nationalities that live right in that area. It's where our Haywood Hills, our Rolling Hills Community Center is going to be. And maybe you want to go there and help us get that started. Or maybe going on a mission trip. Maybe you've never been on a mission trip and you're planning vacations for the next couple of years. You're laying things out. Here's the place I want to go. Why not go to Moldova? I mean, our whole family's going this summer. You can come on, be a part of that. Or go to Italy or go to the Amazon or go, you know, serve in some way. But let's grow in the way that we serve. Third thing is this, share Jesus with others. We talk about it in heaven. You, you're not going to share Jesus with anybody. So this is the time. And we'll talk about the weather a lot. We'll talk about sports a lot. You know, we'll talk about Netflix show a lot with people. But when it comes to spiritual things, a lot of times we kind of like, ah, I don't know, you know. And those other things are fine. But man, what if we started talking more about our faith? What if we started telling people more about our faith? Because in heaven, everybody knows Jesus. And then four, list, invest generously in God's kingdom. <laughs> invest generously in God's kingdom. Guys, you can't take it with you. Right, the old saying where I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul, you know, because you can't take it with you. It, it doesn't matter how much you have. There's a whole movement on Wall Street, right? Die with zero. You know, I would give it all away. And you're like, well, yeah, you're not taking it with you. I don't, you know, Warren Buffett, give away half your wealth. Well, the other half's going somewhere, but not with you, you know. So, I mean, at some point you got to go, can, am I just going to hoard all this or am I going to invest it in the things that will last? Am I going to invest the time, the talent, the resources, the abilities in the things that will matter for the glory of God? That's the beautiful part about heaven. God wants us to know. You know, my encouragement to you is this. We're all going to face death with our family, with our friends, with our grandparents, our great-grandparents. And, and there'll be those times that you stand there in a funeral home. There'll be those times that you stand in a hospital room. I, I, I do that a lot as a pastor. But I pray in those times that you have this faith and this confidence, knowing that your loved one's not going to be lost. <laughs> that your loved one, if they know Jesus, they're going to be in their eternal home, and you're going to be with them one day. You know, it's like taking your grandparents to go on a cruise and you, you walk with them down kind of the boatway, the runway, and you get to the dock and, and they go and they get on the boat to go on the cruise and you're standing on the shore and they come up to the deck and they're waving to you and you're waving to them and then the little boat goes off and it goes off and pretty soon it gets to the horizon and it just disappears. But are they gone? No, they're not gone. Aren't there people on distant shore saying, hey, welcome, <laughs> right? It's warm. It's beautiful. Come on over, right? You will see them again. The second encouragement I give you is this. Whenever your time comes, trust in Jesus. <laughs> know he is with you. Know the place that he has prepared for you. H.S. Laird was talking about when his dad, who was a strong believer, when he lay on his deathbed and H.S. Laird sat by him, he said, dad, what do you, what do you see? His dad said, I see a bright light. He said, Dad, how do you feel? He said, I feel like a little boy on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Just can't wait. Just can't wait. There's no fear in death. There's no worry. When that time comes from all of us that we'll stand before God and you're going to hear God say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into your inheritance. Enter into your rest. Enter into your eternal home. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans. He says, what shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is with you now and forevermore. He loves you, and he will take care of you, and he's preparing a place for you. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. I don't know where you are today. But I know this, God is here. He is with you and he is for you. He sees you and he loves you. He loves you. He doesn't condemn you. He says you are mine, my son or my daughter. Right now where you sit, maybe you just go, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to go to heaven. Forgive my sins, redeem me, restore me. And I want to live my life for you. I want to be your disciple. Maybe today you kind of look at your life and you go, man, I've been living for the things of this world. <laughs> I've been spending time trying to renovate the tent. God, I want, to, I want to live for things that are eternal. God, search my heart. Know my thoughts. And maybe today you just want to worship. God, I want to give all glory to you. Because I was dead in my sins and my transgressions until you made me alive. And that I will reign forever with you. So, Father God, meet us in this moment. Search our hearts. Change our lives. Let us have that hope and that joy and that peace, knowing that heaven awaits. God, we are forever yours. And it's in the beautiful name of Jesus that we pray and worship right now.